Welcome to my talk. Um, I'll be talking about UIs in adventure games for smartphones and tablets. So um, it's certainly more generalized than the talk we just heard. And um, it's also, well, even more specific than the talk we just heard. The guy just now had one line of code. I don't have any. Um, but uh, I hope you'll still enjoy uh, listening. Um, so I've got uh, five steps. Um, first, I'll talk about well, what we're talking about. What is an adventure game? Because that's pretty important uh, to understand why I'm, I took the decisions I took. Um, then we'll have a look at what's been there historically, because uh, the adventure games uh, well, the genre of adventure games has a long tradition. They first appeared in the late 70s. Um, then, why do we have to uh, consider this aspect? Why do we have to change anything for tablets and smartphones anyway? It's been around so long, uh, this genre. Why not keep it as it was? Um, then we'll look at uh, some apps uh, that already exist uh, for smartphones and tablets, and I'll finish by um, showing you an example of what you can do and giving you a few hints if you want to create your own adventure game. So, show by hands, who here has played an adventure game? Okay, that's pretty good. Um, and who thinks he or she could define what an adventure game is? Yeah, I expected that. Um, the problem is the genre changed over time. This is a quote from uh, Ron Gilbert, uh, one of the great names in the adventure genre. When they first introduced uh, Maniac Mansion, which is one of the most famous adventures and one of the milestones in the genre, people said, that's not an adventure game. It doesn't have a text parser. It uses the mouse as input. Nowadays, that's the norm. You hardly find any text adventures anymore. They're still around, but they're rare. Um, and now we're at uh, a place where we have touch screens and we have a whole load of sensors and GPS available and so on and so forth. And um, so the genre can develop and evolve again. Um, I tried defining uh, the adventure genre and I guess I ended up with a superset of what it actually is. But um, here's what I've got. It's, well, it's a video game of some kind. It has puzzle solving. It has uh, exploration. And it has narration. So you want to tell a story. You want to have puzzles. And you want uh, a world in which the, the player, the user, can move around. There are a lot of things you commonly find uh, in adventure games, too. Um, the storyline can be uh, non-linear. It can branch in many ways. You can have different possible endings, so it's interactive storytelling in a way. Most adventure games have a slow, uh, slow pace throughout most of the game. There are a few uh, fast scenes, action sequences, and so on, but they are normally imported from other genres. Um, normally, you have more than one uh, room that you can explore, although a room in this context doesn't mean it has to be inside. Um, you often have NPCs with which you can interact. Most uh, adventure games nowadays have some kind of inventory, so you can carry around items with you. And sometimes you have uh, events that are based on time or randomness or other input from outside the game. So this happens. I could uh, name you exceptions to every one of these things. Um, every uh, point can be left out of an adventure game, and it can still be an adventure game. I don't think I can think of an adventure game that has none of these, but it's 
difficult to, to define. Um, I had people asking whether uh, Final Fantasy was an adventure game or Pokemon. Um, <laughs> they have parts of these uh, things, but I would define neither as, uh, as belonging to the genre. Okay, now in adventure games, you always have actions that you can, uh, uh, you can use, and they are commonly known as verbs. Now, verbs, of course, is a, a term from grammar, and this is a definition for the grammatical term verb. In adventure games, they're used to command uh, the character, to tell him or her what to do. And um, they are normally set in, well, a commanding voice. Here, Maniac Mansion, I already mentioned it. Uh, this is uh, one of the very first uh, adventures uh, that use the point-and-click interface. And uh, the verbs here are all spelled out. So you have push, open, walk to, etc. And um, this is uh, derived from the text adventure era, where you could uh, type, uh, pick up lamp, take lamp, uh, uh, throw lamp, whatever. And if the text parser was uh, smart enough, it would understand what you're trying to do. Um, this obviously allows uh, a lot of freedom, not as much as text parsers, but it's pretty close. Um, and you can, you can offer anything you want. If you like, uh, what's done often nowadays is that these verbs can be represented by symbols. And um, luckily, this is pretty rare. It, uh, this kind of amount, for example, read and what is are normally fused to a, uh, a general look at or look verb. And all of these verbs are normally combined to use or maybe pick up and use, or something like that. <laughs> so it's much simpler to use nowadays uh, in, well, games that use this kind of interface. Then there's an extreme opposite. This is from Mist. Mist has a one-click interface. So it's extremely simple. You click on something and you interact with it. You don't have to choose whether to press a button or to look at something or to talk to someone. Or, well, there are many people in Mist to talk with. But um, you just click on something and you interact with it. The screen is uh, free to have only the environment you're interacting with. You don't need anything else on screen. Um, and you can uh, decide on what to do. Well, you have to decide what to do uh, depending on what you're clicking on. So that's, that's pretty neat. Um, you can allow loads of different things and it, it doesn't need much differentiation. On computers, traditionally, you could uh, still differentiate if you liked. Uh, some games have right mouse click is look at, left mouse click uh, is the interact version. Of course, that's not possible on tablets and smartphones. The, the device can't differentiate which finger you use to, to click something. But one click is still possible, absolutely, and it's used. OK, now this is a different game, Full Throttle. Um, it uses something I call a verb disk. It's this thing here. And basically, uh, this is uh, sort of an a uh, mixture of one click and verb lists. So we have uh, various things we can do here. Um, if you click on the hand, you will use or take something. If you uh, click on the eyes, uh, you will look at stuff, so on, so, and so on and so forth. Um, so it has more options uh, than one click interfaces. Um, it needs much less space than a verb disk, and it doesn't need it permanently. Um, this is obviously a modification that fits the game's topic. Uh, Full Throttle is uh, a game where you play a, a motorbike 
um, guy. I don't know. Um, and uh, so there's skulls, and uh, he can kick stuff and so on. Um, what you can do, and what is also done in some games, is make uh, this uh, interface context uh, sensitive. So depending on what uh, you choose to interact with, it may show different options. So that, again, is a step towards uh, the verb list um, interface, where you have loads and loads of verbs available. But it still takes up very little space. Um, so this is an interesting compromise, which, of course, can be used on smartphones and tablets. And again, this is actually used in some games. Now, one option that is rather difficult to use uh, on, uh, uh, on touchscreen devices, for a reason I already mentioned, is this, uh, um, this method, right-click. So you have various verbs, and you, uh, you scroll through them by clicking the right mouse button. Um, it's, it's more powerful than one click, about as, as powerful as, um, as verb disks. It needs less space than verb disks, um, but it does require a lot of clicking, which can be annoying. And, uh, well, as I said, without the ability to differentiate between fingers, um, it's, there's no real way you can do this on mobile devices yet. You could do that kind of thing, but it's uh, A, it's counterintuitive, and B, that allows you two uh, uh, possibilities. So th this has five, um, and in most cases, you will want to need, uh, you will want more than two. Um, okay, so we've uh, had a look at various uh, types of verbs. Next, the inventory is also an important part of most uh, adventure games. Here we see them all, uh, all items that the character is uh, carrying as symbols, and they're displayed on the screen all the time. It's uh, uh, it's uh, good to use. Um, you don't have to click much because it, it's already there. You don't have to open a menu or anything. But it always takes up space. Um, you can use this on mobile devices, and uh, some games use it. It depends uh, on the design you choose for your specific game, but um, we'll get to that later. This is uh, another method um, where the inventory is shown only on demand. So you have some way of opening uh, the, uh, the inventory interface. Traditionally, that's been a button. You could have a gesture or something like that. So there are different ways to do this. This uh, saves screen space. The problem here is, of course, that interacting is slightly more, uh, more difficult because you have to call the uh, interface before you can use it. And it's a bit more difficult uh, for users to tell how to use objects from in the inventory with the outside. Um, it takes up less space uh, than uh, the, the method of always showing the inventory normally because you only display it on demand. And uh, this, too, is used on mobile devices. It's uh, quite functional. It's a trade-off you have to make. OK, dialogues. Um, as I said, uh, most adventure games have uh, NPCs with uh, which you can interact. So um, one interaction is, of course, talking to them. Most, uh, most games have dialogues in some form. and. Um, Again, there are various methods how this is done. This is uh, a fairly recent game from 2008. And um, you just have a list of uh, things that the character can say. You normally know exactly what they're going to say, because it's normally exactly what it says there. There can be uh, um, exceptions where you click on something, and then you're interrupted or whatever. But um, the general idea is that you know what you're going to say. Um, this allows you to give the player hints. So if 
it's not necessarily clear in what direction a dialogue might go. This is a way where you can suggest, okay, you could ask about X, Y, Z. It does take up a lot of space. Um, obviously, I mean, this is about a third of the screen um, offering a lot of options. But uh, luckily, that's not that much of a problem because while you're in a dialogue, you won't uh, be doing that much uh, else. So you can just have uh, the dialogue taking up most of the screen. That's what you want to interact with anyway. This is uh, the follow-up game from uh, last year. And uh, they chose a different approach here. There are different topics that can be discussed, and they're displayed as symbols. Now, symbols have a positive and negative points to them. You have to read less, which is, is generally a good idea if you want uh, people to be able to play more easily um, or faster. It can make it uh, easier for kids to play, etc. It can be more difficult to understand. If you just uh, uh, list what you're going to say, then you know exactly what you're going to say. Here, there's a certain amount of guessing involved. Um, the hints and uh, jokes I mentioned earlier are much more difficult to give uh, with symbols. But it is much more space efficient. I mean, uh, in the picture just now, it was about a third of the screen, so it went up to around about here. This is just this small box. So um, this is, of course, good if uh, the space is limited. Again, it's a trade-off. Um, and of course, uh, you have a much bigger chance to, um, or much bigger possibilities to design this aesthetically, which uh, is always something nice for designers. There's a third method uh, that's sort of a mixture between both, and that's um, you have topics, but they're displayed by words, so you don't know exactly what the person is going to say. But um, you do have a better idea because you don't have to guess. Um, again, uh, jokes, hints, etc. are more difficult, but hints can be uh, done more easily than with the symbols. It's pretty space efficient, but again, there's uh, the question of how nice does it look? As I said, always a trade-off. Okay, so that's what's been there historically. So where's the problem, or where are the problems? There are a few, mainly related, related to screen size. This is a 15-inch screen like they were common when uh, a lot of uh, these adventure games came out in the 90s, early 90s. And um, that mouse cursor there is to scale. Here's an extended an enlarged version. Right at the top, there's one red pixel. This red pixel is with which you, uh, the, the thing with which you choose what you want to interact with. So even with a relatively low resolution, say 640 times 480, you can be pretty accurate. This is an iPad, and yes, I know this is an Android conference. Sadly, there are many more adventure games available for iOS than for Android at the moment, so I had to do a lot of iOS testing. That's the average size of a fingertip. Um, I hope you see the problem. It's much less accurate. So, what can we do? Um, oh, the uh, second problem, touch screens. Um, less accurate, as I just said. Also, no right mouse button. But you do have uh, the possibility of using stuff like multi-touch or, um, or other sensors. There are loads of sensors you can use. And uh, you can give haptic feedback. So that can uh, make the whole experience more realistic. I'm not the only one who has thought that uh, adventure games could be a good mix for touch screens. Um, this is uh, a guy from 
2012, uh, saying how how good it is, or, or how um, how probable he thinks it is that. Uh, uh, smartphones and tablets are the next logical step. So let's have a quick look at uh, games that have been published and I'll go through this really quickly because I, um, I'm already short on time. First of all, uh, you can have ports which don't uh, differentiate much between the PC version and the mobile version. Simon the Sorcerer is an example. It's very, very uh, similar to uh, the PC version. You can choose between uh, a touchpad control, which is basically what you would have on a computer. You have a cursor on screen that you move by uh, relative to the finger. It works. It's not intuitive for smartphones and tablet users. You can have direct inputs, which is what you would expect from that kind of interface. So you click on look at and it works as look at. Um, the game has magnification to make stuff easier. For example, on this screen, it's one of my favorite examples, there are two objects with which one can interact. One is this little stone. And it's pretty difficult to, to get to with your finger when that's on a 10 inch display or maybe quite considerably smaller. Um, even with that magnification, it's not easy to hit uh, the target, but it's at least possible. And uh, one of the few things they changed was that this bar, which uh, tells you what you're currently doing, was moved to the top. That makes sense, of course, because before it was here, and um, normally you hold your tablet uh, like this, or your phone, so your hand will be covering the command bar. It, that's not really efficient. So they moved that to the top. Um, a, a good idea if you want to show the user what he's currently doing. Then games that have been modified for mobile versions. Uh, the first Monkey Island game is a good example. There's a special edition where the interface was uh, changed quite considerably. So you can switch to the classic interface, mainly for nostalgic reasons, but um, leave that out here. This is the new interface. You have what you would expect, direct control. You click on these items. Now these uh, uh, verbs here are all about a centimeter in diameter, so it fits with uh, a finger size. The average finger is, I believe, nine millimeters, fingertip. Um, they replaced... Uh, a list of words by symbols, which is nice. And uh, they hit the inventory, so you click on that and it'll show the inventory. Saves a lot of space. It used to be showing on the display all the time. And uh, that would take up about a third of the screen. Not good. And again, the command bar was moved to the top. And then you have uh, games that were developed directly for mobile devices. Now, this is really interesting because uh, people thought about, OK, what can we do to make this experience better on mobile devices? There are very few games that were developed like that. This is one. I'm not quite sure how they want the name pronounced. I'll just say 1112. Um, you have context-sensitive verb disks. So you click on something, and it'll offer you uh, options depending on what it is, who it is. Uh, um, clicking on different NPCs will give you different options, etc. cetera. Um, it's played from a first-person perspective, which again saves space. You don't have to display a, a figure on screen. Um, it's a design choice. This is just during uh, dialogues or when he's talking. Um, the inventory is hidden. You can pull it down at the side. And uh, pinch zoom. Now, this is uh, something that's uh, not possible on traditional uh, devices and not necessary on computers and so on. You can zoom in here. And this actually makes, makes a lot of sense because uh, the examples I had earlier, one problem was you had pretty small screens and even tinier objects. If you can zoom in, 
that makes the whole experience much more pleasant and um, much easier to experience. You shouldn't use it too much because uh, in most cases your player will have an overview over the whole screen and won't want to zoom in and out all the time. But uh, you can use it in places. And um, that game even uses uh, sensors a bit. There's at least one place where you use uh, the accelerometer, for example. Okay, so lots of information on what's been around. Um, how can you test this? Well, I designed a few mock-ups. Um, ag again, uh, I, iOS is much bigger on, in this market currently, so... Uh, I'm hoping to change that, but I tested with uh, a mock-up iPad. So here you display the inventory only on demand. Here it's always displayed. You can play with a verb disk or without. Tested uh, uh, loads of different configurations. And um, there were some interesting results. In my test group, um, first person uh, Adventures weren't quite as well received as third-person adventures. That's that's taste, of course. I mean, historically, uh, third-person adventures have been much bigger than first-person ones. It's uh, well, that that's a design question that um, depends on the story you're trying to tell. Um, the interaction uh, with the environment was totally independent from this perspective. Never mind uh, uh, first person, third person, they had no problems understanding how to, uh, how to work it. Combining uh, objects from the inventory with the environment was easier when it was always displayed. Um, there wasn't much uh, difference in how uh, the, uh, the versions were perceived uh, other than the ease of use. So always displaying them, if possible, is probably a good idea. Um, interestingly, uh, if you hit the inventory, it was easier for the users to control the character. I'm not quite sure how to explain that. Maybe you have an idea. I thought I'd throw it out there anyway. And um, both uh, one-click interfaces and verb disks, which are the two that I tested, um, were easily usable. So. Uh, if you want to make it very simple, you can use a one-click interface. If you uh, want to offer more options, verb disks are fine. Works. Uh, works very well. So, you may want to design an adventure yourself. Um, there are some questions uh, you'll have to decide on. Do you want a one-click interface or a verb disk? Do you want to show your inventory at all times, or don't you? Um, what kind of dialogue do you want to choose? It's uh, up to you, of course. They all work. Just make sure you don't use up too much of the screen. Okay, thanks, and do you have any questions? <laughs>